it's interesting that the framework that we understand gardens through uh, and understand landscapes through is largely Eurocentric. The term decolonization is quite familiar now, and uh, we're in a period where uh, in Australia and other and America in a range of places, we've had Black Lives Matter and a whole range of 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 cultural movements um, that try to let us understand how the how the world has been set up and perceived from this sort of Eurocentric perspective. And landscape architecture is definitely true that that um, that the European garden um, has really set up the entire discipline of landscape architecture. Um, myself, I am also a specialist in European landscape architecture and particularly French landscape architecture. And so um, in a way, I'm at least as much as anybody guilty of this. If we, in a paper that I wrote uh, called um, The Landscape of Practices Decolonizing Landscape Architecture, I reflected upon the fact that almost all the history books really set out a lineage where indigenous practices of landscape um, are treated as the kind of zero point or the originary um, primeval aspect. Um, and then there's a sort of progression through time. Walter Didi Mignolo, a theorist of decolonization, talks about this, this sort of uh, zero point of, uh, of, of, of culture where in a way, the Renaissance is treated as the beginning and everything before the Renaissance and outside of uni, of, uh, of uh, Europe is, uh, is actually other. And so with that in mind, it's interesting also to reflect how those European traditions are the foundation of landscape architectural practice and they will be incorporated into the canon and all of the moves that we utilize have come from them. Of course, indigenous practices are not something of the past. They're something of the present. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a research project that I undertook with my collaborators, Jared Katsia, um, Tazama Mbuta, um, and Amy Thompson, uh, called The Gardens of Europe. And it's a really interesting project uh, that we undertook in the, um, the late, in the late 2010s uh, until about 2017, 2018, that really looked at gardens in Cape Town. It was called the Gardens of Europe because of the fact that it was really about the European, um, really about a, a formal settlement. And so really it's sort of, you know, the, the thing about, about uh, South Africa that people may or may not know, probably most people would, is obviously there's been this legacy of, of uh, apartheid um, that's been really a, a really major part of South Africa's uh, history. And so interestingly, you know, in, in a way, <clears throat> there is this sort of colonial legacy, obviously, in South Africa, as well as the sort of transformations that happened after the end of apartheid uh, in relationship to uh, the period when it became a democratic country. Uh, the 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 site that I'm uh, the and I suppose the main thing to to note about it for people who don't know the history of, of of South Africa is really about what's called the Group Areas Act, and the Group Areas Act was was creating areas that were dedicated to different um, ethnic groups, racial groups, and so there were areas where black people could live, areas where Indian people could live, areas where quote unquote coloured people could live. And areas where white people could live. And this caused there were what's known as forced relocations that happened to really restructure the city. And that's what we regard as the, the apartheid city. And now what people are dealing with in South Africa is the post-apartheid city. And so these pictures here, these photographs by Svea Josefi, you know, she's looking at really how in uh in South Africa there are these sort of resonances. Now, a guy called um um uh, Neil Masterton, uh, who now works for the practice Ashton Ragan at Google, coined this term dim resonance to describe the way that the colonies and the original places share names and, and share ideas. And so Lavender Hill on the left here is actually one of the, the areas where, um, where the, uh, uh, a lot of this dormitory housing for black people and for colored people was happening. And so sites of relocation and 
and and you know looking at these resonances between London and and South Africa, she's really exploring or um, questioning um, place. Now, the place that I want to talk about is a place called Europe, and it's it starts. If we look at it. It starts in the in the earliest in sort of not not in the earliest, but in the period of the sort of of the sort of uh, mid to late. 20th century, uh, and really it starts as a, a, a rubbish tip. And you can see here a road, which is the road to the airport. Um, and then you can see these sort of suburbs around. And these were suburbs for a, essentially a, a black area, quote unquote, called Gugletu. And so what happened is originally, obviously, that, that process, there was a, travel was restricted for certain groups and for black people. Um, they were allowed, there was a thing called the pass book or the Dom pass, where people actually um, had to show where they lived. And so in a way, movement was really restricted. Now, in 1994 and after 1994, what you see here in this next photograph is the way that informal settlement has become, started to happen on this former, former tip site here. And so over the next period of years, you can start to see the concentration of how of you know people would might call it slums, they might call it shanty towns, but all of this has developed over that period to the point where we are sort of now, where in a way that whole site is incredibly densely populated. And a lot of that 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 informal settlement is coming from people who are have family in Google Etu, and a lot of the people in, in Google Etu are, are closer people who've come from the Eastern Cape, and really they've relocated to Cape Town for work, and they're living in this area because a lot of people from the Eastern Cape, um, who are their family members, are formally living here. So here we see informal and formal uh, have an adjacency. Now, there is, you can sort of slightly pick it up, but on one side of this site, on the right-hand side here, it was named by the population Europe, and on the left-hand side, it was named um, it was named Barcelona. And because the airport is nearby, there was, a, you know, even though people are living informally, often they're still in, in normal work, the, the employment is indeed low in South Africa, but that there is still employment. So a lot of people here are working at the airport. Um, and so in a way, this relationship between, between this informal settlement in the city of Cape Town at the base of, of South Africa, far away from Europe, is tied to Europe because people who are working here are actually also involved in the airport. And um, obviously, Barcelona is related to the football club, etc. So here again, we see these resonances between different places. And so, you know, it's interesting that that when we, you know, I, I discovered this this site because of the of working with uh, one of my thesis students uh, from Landscape Master of Landscape Architecture Program, Amy Thompson, and she was really you know, interested in, in working in this area, um, uh, Europe. And so this is what Europe looks like. You can see that, that you know, there are, it's basically, you know, on this sort of, this is sort of old tip side, as I say. Um, and here we have these these shacks. Um, you know, you can see the, the power infrastructure, which is servicing them. They don't necessarily have toilets. They may have communal toilets. And in a way, informality is very much set up as something that's the opposite of the city. It's something where, in a way, we have the, the modern contemporary city, which is seen as being formal, highly designed, et cetera. And then the informal city in Asia, Africa, um, South America, India, et cetera, is treated as this kind of backward aberration, much like places that were not inside Europe were treated. But in actual fact, if you look at um, if you look at Paris in the period immediately around and before Haussmann, in actual fact, that is, for all intentions purposes, that is also informality. And if you look at Melbourne in the back valleys of Melbourne, we're seeing also what they would call otherwise in South Africa backyarders. We're seeing this kind of way that that those things, that that, that sort of informality, improvisation, et cetera, was happening. So rather than it being that that these countries are kind of backward and in this terribly impoverished state, et cetera, 
we really should be seeing them as part of a, in, in the state of a dynamic transformation, which has actually happened in waves throughout the world, including in the originary places of, of Europe. And obviously now over time, those same places, I mean, here we've got Melbourne, and we can see that in actual fact, we're now fetishizing, uh, we're fetishizing that, that informality and that roughness. And, you know, the laneways, which were those same laneways that were the slums that caused the high-rise housing to be built in Melbourne to rehouse these poor slum dwellers, are now laneways in expensive areas. And um, that sort of sense of grittiness is something that is now desirable. And so it tells you that there's not a lot of certainty to these categories about formality and informality. So in Amy's thesis, you know, she explored that relationship between Europe as the place that is the old world, the urban center and the model for urbanity, and then also, you know, juxtaposing here um, Europe in uh, in Europe itself and Europe in, in South Africa to explore what's old, what's new, strategies of urbanism in one place, strategies of urbanism in another way, in other place, etc. Now, when she introduced me to that area, I became really fascinated with the fact that as a gardener and as a horticulturalist um, with an interest in a scholarly interest in plants and maintenance, I became really interested in, in the fact that there were gardens in Europe. And obviously that play, play on words was interesting to me because, because of that idea about this sort of informal settlement being called Europe and and obviously the, the kind of classical Europe we have. And so that play between the gardens of Europe, as in the gardens of the informal settlement versus the gardens of Europe being uh, in Europe proper was something that was really interesting to me. And so with my collaborators, including um, Amy, who then, who then graduated and became a practitioner and has an amazing practice called Yes And in Cape Town now, working in the informal settlement that we were researching, as well as the photographer, Jared Kutsia, um, to, together with a, a closer woman, Artisan Mputa, who did translation for us and, uh, and engaging with the community. We began a research project where we sort of tried to investigate these gardens of Europe and learn a little bit about them. And so in this, in this presentation, what I'm going to do is talk about a few of the people that we met and we interviewed in their gardens and kind of look at this resonance between, between garden ideas from Europe and other parts of the world and then what's happening in the informal settlement and sort of play around between the edge of, of this idea of poverty and this idea of maybe sort of, you know, um, contemporariness, the hip, et cetera, and like really play with that edge. And so the first person we met was this guy called Sakile, um, um, Sakile Mieki. And he and I worked together for a number of years. Um, he worked and he was what was often called a garden boy. And that's a racist epithet that existed in South Africa to describe um, uh, to describe gardeners. And obviously the term boy is a very racially charged term and particularly racially charged because um, a lot of these closer men are actually also, um, they're men, they were initiated. And so in a way he was what you would have called previously a garden boy, but was actually a gardener, obviously. And so he and I engaged a lot as gardeners um, and he was working in uh, all parts of different parts of, of, of Cape Town. And in fact, you know, it's very interesting to look at where he was coming from because you start to see the mobility that creates, that was created, the mobility issues created by the apartheid city. So he's come from the Eastern, Eastern Cape. He's living in Europe, but he's also working in parts of pine lands and he goes through these really circuitous routes to go home. Um, and he's working in pine lands. And pine lands is a, is a garden city suburb of Cape Town in what was previously a white area. Here you can see the presence of Table Mountain nearby. And Sakila's garden is fascinating because of the fact that ultimately he made that garden completely out of nothing. And so the site itself, as you can start to see in this picture, I mean, you can see there the soil. It's really gravels and backfills on the tip. Um, and, and what's really interesting is that, what, that the people he was working for who were a gay couple in Pinelands, they really taught him how to garden. And so... Initially, they sort of taught him how to make soil. And they had a fascinating process of making soil, which really involved um, digging a hole, uh, cutting up bits of paper and other material, uh, watering the soil in it, letting, creating a compost in the ground, 
digging a hole next to it, adding more material and moving some of the soil from the previous hole into it, adding some water. And over time, he actually improved the whole soil. And also, you know, if we look at the vegetation, all of the vegetation here is actually vegetation that that he harvested from other gardens where he was, and he was very clear to say he was not stealing plants. He was in a situation where people were throwing out stuff or as a job, he was clearing stuff from people's gardens. And so he was really uh, made this garden out of other gardens. And so it's really interesting when you look at it, you know, some of these plants like these yuccas here are from, are from uh, um, uh, you know, America. Here we can see euphorbia, which is a plant that landscape architects use. Um, you know, we can see other succulents, etc. There's some sort of aloes that were from South Africa, some nithopia, some red hot poker, etc. And here you see on the left actually a wattle tree from Australia. And so wattles were actually an introduced plant into South Africa for stabilization that became an invasive species. But interestingly, over time, the wattles in South Africa, the Australian wattles, became a major source, economic source because you could actually burn them to produce heat and fire for cooking, um, as well as for brying. And so in actual fact, for, for people who were cooking on fires, collecting invasive timber and then packaging it and selling it was an income source because for the South African brine, which is their sort of way of cooking meat, of which I'm an enormous fan, this exotic Australian species actually is the, the preferred species. And so I always used to joke with my South African friends to say, you'd have no brine if it weren't for Australian wattles. And so, um, you know, if you look at this garden, you know, Sakili's garden at these moments, you know, also here's Sansevieria, which is a native plant in South Africa, which is the mother-in-law's tongue. You know, this could be actually a cottage garden. And so really that modality of working and, and landscaping, you know, this is this is Sakili's own design, you know, resembles people like Gertrude Jekyll and Lutyens. Uh, and in actual fact, um, you know, this is this is really if we took out the informal settlement out of this, we looked at these pebbles and these bricks, you know, this could easily be a really nice cottage garden by any, in any other frame. And, you know, the garden itself was quite interesting, you know, because Sakila used to joke that, well, not to joke, actually, we asked him about watering, and, you know, he has to water it, really could only exist because of the fact that, you know, that was the plan of the garden, um, you know, it could only really exist because there was this water point nearby and so he was able to bring water into the garden uh, he also had a bucket toilet for example um, and you know in a way what's really interesting also in terms of housing <coughs> and land tenure is that that um, there is a, no, a code on the door of the house uh, so let's see, let's, oh, yeah, you can see this number e40 what is it e45 or e45455. So this process is a process called enumeration, where basically non-profit groups like Slum Dwellers International will enumerate all of the individual buildings and then they get placed on a register. And because of that constitution of South Africa after apartheid guaranteeing everybody a house, in actual fact, um, that number is a place in the queue. So when, even though it might seem like the bricks, like this materiality of it is actually totally rustic and, and scavenged, et cetera, it has economic value because that number eventually will end up with a house. And so Sakila actually bought this dwelling as much for that number as anything else. That's one of the gardens we looked at, which is fascinating. And Sakila and I, you know, you know Sakila and I actually, uh, you know, uh, we ended up working quite a bit with also with his son and with his, his brother. Um, and he and I did a lot of landscaping and I hired most of the family to work on landscape projects with me because he had real expertise um, in that area. And, and so in this idea of a sort of story, there's a really interesting story here, which is around another guy who's living um, at, uh, at Europe, whose name is, is Sam. If you look at where Sam's living, you know, he's living, this is, you know, he's living in a spot where in other parts, very nearby, having that kind of view of the mountain would be like a really fabulous thing, that table mountain under that. And so to some degree, you know, it's he, he's lucky with his, his orientation, but obviously this circumstance uh, is difficult uh, and very personal, and I'll talk about it. And ultimately, you know, what Sam's done is his garden is a very simple one, is that really he's just got this 
this hedge down the side here. And in a way, what I tried to argue is, you know, or to look at was to suggest that it was a really, in a way, his design, it was a design, it was a very functional, simple design about creating a hedge and creating a kind of a little open area next to it. And in a way, we should treat these a bit more as design that sort of resembles some of the ideas about, about functional, the, fun, the garden as a functional space in the early 20th century in Germany uh, in particular. Now, this plant that's growing here is really what I, I want to talk about a little bit, which is that it's called the, the um, it's uh, Mirabilis jalapa, which is called the marble of Peru. And the fascinating thing about Mirabilis jalapa is that it's actually, it's come from Peru and it's had a very interesting story. And I wrote an article um, in, in, a, in, a, in a journal of African architecture called Folio, where I looked at the, 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 the travels of Mirabilis jalapa. And so ultimately, it's a fascinating story that tells you a lot about people and movement and cultural networks. So, for example, Mirabilis Jalapa was discovered in the around the the uh, Columbus's trip to um, uh, to the Americas, and in that process, it made its way uh, back to Europe. And indeed, um, you know, Linnaeus and others actually classified it. Uh, at the time, and it was added to the botanical collection. So it's called the Marvel of Peru because of this pink flower that it had. And over time, interestingly, I tried to track what happened and how it ended up in Cape Town because essentially it is a weed. It's a it's a weed plant, and uh, even though it's got a pink, a kind of quite an attractive pink flower. Uh, and ultimately, what's interesting is that when Africa, when when explorers were were moving into uh, the Congo, they actually discovered this plant. And so they then sent a sample in the, you know, in the, in the late 1800s, middle to late 1800s. They then sent uh, a sample back to get it classified and discovered that in actual fact, it was already on record from you know 300 years earlier. So how did it end up in the middle of the, in the Congo 300 years later to be collected by somebody who previously had never been you know, an unexplored part? And what we see here is a really interesting dynamic around plants, which is that plants get traded because they also found corn in, this, in these parts of Africa as well. And corn also came back at that same time. And if you look at the trading networks that were happening in Europe at that time, plants were being brought back from a whole range of places. And plant collection is really the history of ornamental plants. And so plants were coming back from Asia, they were coming from China. They were coming into Europe from the Americas, from North America, from Australia, and then spreading around in other places. And so in terms of Mirabilis jalapa and corn, both were actually, well, definitely with corn, it was traded by Arab slave traders out of Zanzibar, out of the uh, uh, Omani, uh, Omani slave network that was had been actually um, capturing slaves or trading slaves right through this area called the Sahil into the Congo. So here was the bottom of, uh, is, the, is sort of the edge between the arid zone in Africa. And so countries, you know, um, countries like Sudan, uh, et cetera, in that, that area. And so there was this trade going right across Africa in that way. And then there was an activity happening amongst tribes in uh, uh, African tribes where tribes would capture and sell um, their uh, other tribes who which they were battling to slave traders, Arab slave traders who would then trade them back out into the rest of Europe and the world and into uh, uh, into the Middle East, etc. And so corn came from those areas like through because obviously the economic value of corn was highly recognized and you can grow it from a dried out thing, right? So corn is super easy to grow, high calorie, uh, put transportable. So it ended up like Mirabilis jalapa in the middle of Africa through other non-Western trading systems. And it's a fascinating idea that plants can move like that. And so, you know, the process of Mirabilis jalapa ending up here on this side is quite interesting also because, you know, it ends up in Cape Town in, in sort of actually even earlier than that, it ends up in Cape Town in about 1700. Um, and then by that, by, at which point there were no, not really black people. There were colored people who were the, who were the inheritors of a, of a kind of a, 
slaves from, or you know, the progeny of slaves from the um, uh, slaves from Indonesia brought in by the Dutch, together with the indigenous Khoi Khoi people from Cape Town, and this sort of racist epithet, coloured people, which is nonetheless still utilised as a description. And those that community were living in Cape Town, the black people were still not really down in this part of the world. And so interestingly, when we look at the fact that Sam has this hedge in his garden, it's a really interesting uh, story. Um, and so, you know, basically what happened is that he moved to Cape Town for work for um, about 20, in the 80s. And so he's also an early resident for this site. And really in that period, um, he's actually only ever had, uh, his wife only visited him once and he only went up back to the Eastern Cape where his family was once. And when she came down, she collected some seeds from of Mirabilis Jalapa, which they didn't know what it was. She just collected those seeds and put them in her bag, came down on the minibus taxi, saw, saw, saw Sam, and she basically just cast her, her hand across that edge there. And so in it really that is a, this hedge of Mirabilis Jalapa is a love letter made of seeds cast by a hand um, that has become ultimately something that has then started to spread through the rest of Europe. And it's got these pink flowers. And interestingly, you know, that idea about spreading things in that way is Jules Clement, who's a, a very well-known landscape architect, has talked about using movement to cast seed to create landscape patterns and like this. So this is the this is him spreading seeds and over time the shape of his movement becomes a growth pattern. In actual fact, that's similar to what was happening in this space. Now, interestingly, in the informal settlements here, and uh, in actual fact, Mirabilis jalapa is a plant that has a um, that that is utilized or has developed a use by what people who are called sangomas, and sangomas are uh, sort of well, kind of you could say that they are witch doctors, but they're also part, some of them are medical practitioners in their own way of traditional medicine, and so they've actually worked out that 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 the seeds themselves were useful for helping women deal with cramps during the lead up to childbirth. And so in a way, and what's interesting about this is of course, this plant is a noxious weed because of the fact that it is not from South Africa and nearby environmental people would be trying to remove this plant as a weed because they would say it's invasive, it's not from South Africa. Meanwhile, people who are from South Africa have incorporated into their traditional their traditional medicine. And this shows you that the categories we utilize about plants are really uh, are really interesting and uh, uh, culturally constructed. Um, from, and so they don't always actually overlap so well. And that idea about weeds, you know, where is a really interesting space at the moment because you know increasingly there is a body of writing, you know, around utilizing at weeds and that's been their, their name's been changed to be called spontaneous vegetation because in a way the weed is a plant that actually grows well on its own and so there's a whole range of recent books uh, like these for instance you know why invasive species will be nature's salvation rambunctious gardens by emma maris wild urban plants of the north northwest by my friend peter del tradici you know planting in a post wild world by by Thomas Rayner and Claudia West, et cetera. And so in a way, that sort of idea of the weed is under reconsideration. And so the sort of pragmatism that we're seeing in these, in these places such as Sam's is really a demonstration of a type of thinking that's only now becoming valid and thoughtful in, in the discourse of plants in, um, in, in the West and in design culture. Now, you know, <clears throat> Part of that really is a recognition, and that's in a weird sort of way, is that a recognition about what's called IPS or Indigenous Knowledge Systems, or also what's known as um, uh, as TEK, T-E-K, Traditional Ecological Knowledge. And so, you know, in actual fact, what's interesting about that notion is that if we reject this idea that the traditional is way back there and the pre pre-colonial or whatever, and we accept that really. Um, it's dynamic and current, then it's really interesting that, that there would be a, um, 
a kind of a, a incorporation of the non-Indigenous into Indigenous practices. It's a really interesting idea. I don't think we're in that space in Australia. Uh, I think we're very much still in the Indigenous only space, but interestingly in Africa, that's not regarded as a question for African people. Now, the people who live <clears throat> the people who live in uh, uh, in this area are actually people from the Eastern Cape, uh, Corsa people. I have trouble pronouncing that properly. I'm trying. Um, and so, interestingly, um, you know, Tazama's family is from that background. And so, Tazama did some research talking to her mother and her family. This is traditionally where they're uh, where they're coming from. And so, you know, when you see, interestingly, when you see here this term Igadi. And so you can see here we have this sort of uh, this area where we, uh, in the home you have next to it these these areas of igadi. Now the uh, uh, the the often the, there's a, a sort of attachment to 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 uh, English words, and so the in Corsa, Corsa there will be actually a addition of this this isi or e on top of a Western word. And so Igadi seems to be, it's about like a garden, but in actual fact, that's the way that that the uh, Corsa people will add, um, will indicate that, yes, there is this term garden, but it's actually not a Corsa term. It's a, it's a term that's been incorporated from the West. And so in the garden, in actual fact, you know, this is where, you know, Tazama is talking to her, her um, to her mother about this. And so, um, you know, the garden, in a way, the first garden around the house is, is actually an ornamental garden. It's really where the children learn to garden because the proper garden is further out and that's for growing food. And so there was no tradition of the ornamental garden. There was only this kind of test garden near the house to learn gardening technique, to work on the next level of gardening, which is actually out uh, out in the main part. And when it says merely, that means uh, corn and obviously pumpkin. Now we accept here that corn is also a Europe is a a, 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 a plant, as I said, that's coming from uh, through Western expansion uh, and invasion of of uh, of, that, of um, the Americas. So that's fascinating how it's been incorporated into that culture, right? Because culture is dynamic. And, you know, this is the kind of way that these landscapes traditionally, these landscapes now operate and look in the, in the Eastern Cape. Now, for Sekila, who I talked about, you know, we were obviously the students, everyone's fascinated by productive landscape. And so everyone's like, oh, are you using this to grow medicinal plants or plants to eat? And he's like, no, 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 this is a garden. And what he meant by that was, you know, he's a, he, because it's not something that people do. Traditionally, people don't grow in his culture plants for pleasure. And so for him to be having a garden was in a way a sign of wealth, a sign of differentiation, a sign of innovation. And so he was like, no, 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 this is a garden. This is actually about this new thing, a garden, you know, it's fascinating, which is, is you know, for him it was not about the traditional, it was about something that was quite different. We met two other people who I'll talk about really quickly. And one of them uh, is, was, is a really interesting kind of story, uh, it's sort of a sad story. And, and this is uh, a woman called Violet. And the way we found Violet is we tried to find the tree that, that the, we tried to find the, the biggest tree in the area. And so ultimately what she had in her block is that she had this tall wattle tree. So again, you know, we can see it's a wattle, but it's also a different species of wattle. It's actually the species that kind of, you know, Baileyana, it's one of the species that is actually around, uh, around, uh, Canberra and we see around the place in, in Eastern Australia. Um, and so, you know, for her, you know, she had a real relationship with this, with this tree. And it was, it was quite interesting that the, the garden didn't really have much about it, but there was a really lovely quality to the, to the place. And I was reminded of, of this kind of the way that these sort of sublime and rustic landscapes often just feature this one, this kind of one gnarled tree um, on the, on the block. One of the sad things about meeting her, she's a lovely woman, is that as soon as when I turned up the door to the door, you know, she was as pale as a sheep because, as she said, when a white man used to turn up to your door in a, in uh, South Africa in the bad old days, there was never anything good about it. So 
So I had to, we had to go through a process of her of her learning to to sort of talk to us and feel comfortable with talking to us, and we had to gain her trust, etc. She was a really lovely woman, but it was just interesting how for her that tree was such a potent thing, and how in the history of landscape that sort of sense of a single tree having a certain sort of property of rusticness is really important. One of the most interesting guys we came across is this guy um, called Sia, and. You know, each time I'm trying to kind of find a way sort of into other domains, if it's Gardens of Europe, which is about Europe being a uh, um, both the origin, the misnomer, which is this is not Europe. I've always tried to find this thing between the originary and the reference and the place and the different, that dynamic of places and placefulness. You know, it's, what's really interesting is that for, for Sia, you know, he had a totally different sort of approach to his garden. Uh, that was really pulling on an entirely different tradition. I mean, he, he was, you know, obviously there's a there's a thing that was sort of that's interesting to me that that I I find sort of deeply problematic, which is a kind of fetishization of the of the, the of the shack in a way. And so on the one hand, it's a really fine line because on the one hand, you want to accept that. Uh, you want to recognize the innovation and the the kind of entrepreneurialism, but the innovation and the resilience and um, the way that people in tough circumstances can make a place of beauty and a home out of virtually nothing. And so that's a kind of respectful mood. But on the other hand, there's also something which is really about uh, actually, um, you know, a sort of a, a fetishization. And so when I visited the High Line one time, there was this art this art exhibition below of this sort of artist who was sort of playing with this idea of sort of housing insertions into informal settlements. And I remember being very offended by that idea that that uh, um, of treating that like it's a sort of aesthetic site. But at the same time, you know, when Jared, the photographer, uh, you know, who we were working with, you know, when he was photographing, you know, Sia's place, he was really able to bring out this kind of really rich, uh, saturated quality of the aesthetic that Sia had developed at his place. And, you know, in a way that if we look at that aesthetic, it was not it was not really hugely plant-based, but it was really based around the colours, you know, collecting colours and textures and, uh, um, and other materials as much as it was about gardening per se. And he really... He didn't really garden, even though he actually had a pretty decent amount of plants. For him, it was always about this sort of curation and this collection of different um, of different materials uh, and found objects to make his own his own sort of aesthetic. And as you can see, you know, in these kind of moments, there's a sort of a you know a, a really nice gathering together and, and pulling together of bits and pieces, particularly on the on, you know in the use of surfaces, etc. And so this reminded me of, of, a, of a kind of a few movements in design, because in a way, the garden is also a place where um, artists have operated. And so one of the most famous gardens like this is this guy called Derek Jarman, who's passed away. And Derek Jarman um, was an artist who ultimately built a, a garden very close to a, to a nuclear, um, I think it's a nuclear reactor, and his garden really, you know, was a lot of it was actually about collecting and putting together um, odd found objects in this sort of postmodern period. And, and the garden for him was a kind of, you know, this is an earlier photograph of it. The garden was a kind of a muse and a collection and a size of organization. That fine layer, fine line between kitsch and taste and uh, and that sort of aspect of of, you know, of DIY gardening, you know, there is a there is a kind of aesthetic to it. Now, on the one hand, ironically, it's something that can either come together to be a beautiful thing, or it can come together to be uh, to be kind of this hideous area. And as we know from the history of landscape, you know, this idea of taste as a fine line between the tasteful, the tasteless, as we know, between the sublime, the picturesque, and the beautiful. Those lines between them. Uh, and, and, and artists have been really interested in the garden as a place to explore that, you know. And so, as you know, you know, other examples of that is, you know, this is like, you know, Kanye West, you know, famously did this sort of brand, uh, sort of um, Yeezus sort of brand uh, 
opening, which was really based around exploring these kinds of, of languages that were arising in the in the informal settlement and the black diaspora around the world. And you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Kahinda Wiley, you know, was really also sort of creating these floral landscapes with sort of streetwear in them. And so there's this sort of interesting space between sort of black culture, DIY, appropriation, um, the turning of the colonists' language against themselves. And in landscape architecture, you know, we've had the work of, of Martha Schwartz, who also in a similar way to Sia's garden, which is the bagel garden, literally was just organizing and arranging these objects like mulches, bagels, et cetera, in this way where the garden sort of becomes an area of gardenerly arrangement rather than specifically about plants. So in the presentation, what I've tried to sort of demonstrate to you is that is a few things. And one of them is to obviously explain and talk about the fantastic people and the amazing stories of these people who are living in, um, in uh, Europe and making gardens in the informal settlement, but also to look at how these resonances of other landscape traditions and other garden traditions can really play out uh, in a place like this and how ideas about things, something being the front and being contemporary and something being sort of poor and in the back are really transposed if one looks at the qualities of things. And particularly in terms of plants, what I've tried to show is also in the example of Sam and also Sakile, is how these sort of networks of movement and discovery and, and distribution of plants, whether it be for Sakile close by in, uh, in pine lands from this garden that he was working in where it's made, he's basically found plants that are going to be drought tolerant and brought them into this garden or Sam, the movement of the, of the, of the um, Mirabilis jalapa from South America all the way to Africa and then finding its way back down to Cape Town through this, this sort of, through his wife's action and this sort of the category of what's weed, what's allowable in a botanical collection and not. And I suppose, you know, for Violet, the sort of wattle as this sort of picturesque tree, this plant from Australia, that has really only survived because it's a weed. It survived because it, it came up on its own and you know she appreciated the microclimatic and the sort of the value of it. Uh, and so I think that the a sort of key learning for us for us here is really about these sort of cultural categories, these ideas of places of origin, um, this idea of mobility and plants, you know, is a really fundamental concept. And so um, you know, I think that to some degree we're in an interesting period of flux where where there's a broader acceptance that that environments after climate change are changing, where plant distributions are changing. Um, but ultimately, there's still this tension between what deserves to be there and not deserve, and doesn't deserve to be there. And we have to understand that, explore and be critical around that boundary between, on the one hand, preserving existing flora and systems, <clears throat> as well as recognizing the values that can come out of these new novel ecosystems. 